Good evening, everyone. My name is Andrew Fracknoy. I'm the Emeritus Professor of Astronomy here at Foothill College, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here in the Smithwick Auditorium and those of you watching on YouTube to this lecture in the 23rd year of the Silicon Valley Astronomy Lectures. Uh, we're delighted to be back in person here at Foothill, but we're still going to continue to have video of each lecture available on YouTube, and we're very glad to have you join us in either location. Um, I want to thank the co-sponsors of this public lecture series, the Foothill College Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math Division, the SETI, or Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Institute, the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, and the University of California Observatories, which includes the local Lick Observatory in San Jose. Um, the programs are designed for uh, making sure that the public understands some of the frontier areas of astronomy, and there's no frontier area, in my mind, as exciting as the search for our counterparts among the stars. And that's our topic for tonight. Um, now, I do have one important announcement. The speaker who was scheduled to speak tonight lost his voice. This is the first time that we've ever had this happen in 23 years, but I talked to him on the phone and he really was in no shape to be able to talk. But we're very lucky to have a wonderful speaker from the same project and the same topic to talk to you. So there is nothing that's changed in terms of the program itself. Uh, and so I'd like to now introduce our speaker. Um, and before I do, actually, I should mention that we will have questions at the end. Dr. Croft has agreed to take questions. There'll be a microphone there in the middle of the auditorium, one microphone, where people can line up to ask questions so we and everyone at home can hear the questions that you ask. So if you have questions, write them down for yourself during the lecture, and then we'll have a question and answer period at the end of the program. All right, now let me introduce our speaker, Dr. Steve Croft. Dr. Croft grew up in England, where he received a PhD in astrophysics from Oxford University before he moved to California to work as a postdoctoral researcher at the Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Um, since 2007, he has been a researcher at the University of California at Berkeley. Now he is a full-time scientist on the Breakthrough Listen Project, which he will describe and which we're all very excited about, a project to search for extraterrestrial intelligence with a thoroughness that's never been attempted before. He serves as Project Breakthrough Listen's scientist for the Green Bank Telescope and is the director of the National Science Foundation-funded Berkeley SETI Research Center research experiences for undergraduate site. That means they bring undergraduates from all over the country to learn more about the exciting science going on here and to themselves become better scientists as a result. He's also involved in many aspects of the planning, execution, analysis, and publication of the results from the search that is the essence of the program, as well as for proposal writing, documentation, coordinating, writing press releases, and much of the outreach and education that happens with the project. So I can think of very few people as well equipped and as ready to take this sudden opportunity and to tell the Silicon Valley Astronomy Lectures all about our boldest effort to answer our oldest question, the breakthrough listen search for intelligent life beyond Earth. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Stephen Croft. Thanks, Andy. Uh, yeah, so um, as, as Andy said, unfortunately, uh, my boss, Dr. Andrew Seeming, couldn't be here, so this is the first change that's going to take place tonight. We'll just do a little search and replace up there on the slide. And I also had to scramble uh, to, to write an abstract for the talk. I mean, one went out that I think would do, but as uh, many 
college students and others who are in a bit of a crunch these days do, I turned to ChatGPT and I asked it to write an abstract for a public talk about Breakthrough Listen by Dr. Steve Croft. In this public talk, Dr. Steve Croft will delve into the exciting world of Breakthrough Listen, a project aimed at searching for evidence of extraterrestrial life in the universe. Dr. Croft, an expert in the field of astronomy, will provide an in-depth overview of the project's goals, methodology, and state-of-the-art technology. He will explain how Breakthrough Listen uses advanced radio telescopes and artificial intelligence algorithms to scan the cosmos for signs of intelligent life. Additionally, Dr. Croft will discuss the broader implications of this research, including the possibility of discovering new life forms and what this could mean for our understanding of the universe. This talk is perfect for those with an interest in astronomy, astrobiology, and the search for extraterrestrial life, and promises to be both informative and engaging. Well, thanks, ChatGPT. <laughs> that, that, that is absolutely unedited um, from, from what ChatGPT put out when, when I put this in. So um, the, the, the robots are coming, and I'll tell you a little bit how uh, the robots are going to help us find the aliens, or as we put it, um, uh, artificial intelligence in search of extraterrestrial intelligence. I think it's incredible technology. It's uh, sort of challenging technology uh, to, to, to wrap our heads around, but um, I'll, I'll touch on this a little bit later in the talk. So again, this is one of our oldest questions. So going back to Lucretius in uh, 60 BC, uh, he said, nothing in the universe is unique and alone, and therefore in other regions there must be other Earths inhabited by different tribes of men and breeds of beasts. And about 1,500 years later, Nicholas of Cusa in 1440, life as it exists on Earth in the form of men, animals, and plants is to be found, let us suppose, in the solar and stellar regions. Rather than think that so many stars and parts of the heavens are uninhabited and this Earth of ours alone is peopled, we will suppose that in every region there are inhabitants. So there's people doing thought experiments here. They didn't really have the technology to do uh, a, an observational scientific experiment, but they're thinking about the idea that there might be other life out there. Uh, in the 19th century, this was the, the New York Sun ran um, maybe one of the first hoaxes in SETI. So this was the moon hoax, the great moon hoax, where they said uh, that uh, Sir John Herschel, uh, at uh, his observatory on the Cape of Good Hope, had spotted uh, these sort of bat-like creatures. I mean, this is where I think we get the term moon bat um, from these, these bat-like creatures that were flying around on the moon. Uh, got quite a bit of traction. This is sort of one of the dangers, I suppose, of working in, in a field like this, that if you're not careful uh, about statements that you make in public and to the press, hopefully nobody will misinterpret anything that I'm saying here this evening, but it can get a little out of hand, even if you're just having a bit of fun. So um, for, for reference, there are no bats on the moon, as far as we know. Um, then, uh, you know, everything got a bit weird in 2020. Um, Egypt had to tell Elon Musk that the pyramids were not built by aliens, and they invited him to come out there and check. Um, you know, this is a long-running hoax, I guess, that still goes around. Uh, and then, you know, you've probably seen, I'm sure, various videos. This wonderful UFO video, a multicolored UFO, caught on camera um, above Liverpool, near where I grew up in the UK. Uh, we were standing there in the backyard having a smoke, and my husband said, look at that the Liverpool Echo report. So I think you're probably all convinced now that we have indeed been visited by aliens. Um, so how do you actually go about doing an experiment to find them? Well, uh, you know, maybe you put your tinfoil hat on, you think uh, you know, maybe radio is a good bet, I'm gonna wave a radio antenna around, but I think we can be a little bit more scientific about this. And I think that we should be a little skeptical when people come to us and claim that they have evidence of aliens. Normally it's not aliens. Aliens should sort of be the last explanation that you go to when you have a strange phenomenon, and this actually happened in the uh, 1960s when Jocelyn Belbrunel at Cambridge University first discovered pulsars. And she wrote on the, the chart that came out of the telescope, LGM, LGM1, little green man. Is this a little green man? Well, it turned out no. It's a uh, rapidly rotating neutron star. Some of these things are really incredible, just as an aside. They're sort of um, uh, the mass of the sun in something that's the size of the Bay Area some of them spinning as fast as a kitchen blender. And uh, the, you know, they're really exotic astrophysical objects. So it's not aliens, but it's interesting astrophysics. And this is also another theme that we get from our SETI searches, um, that sometimes we don't find the aliens, but we find other interesting stuff as we're looking and as we're developing new techniques. So although we haven't had any experimental evidence uh, uh, that has sort of passed uh, peer review muster thus far that there is life anywhere else other than Earth, it's a vast cosmos, right? There's hundreds of billions of stars in our galaxy, and we now know that about one in five of those stars probably has uh, a planet like Earth, a small rocky planet that exists in the region, the Goldilocks zone, where it's not too hot and not too cold, 
and liquid water could potentially exist on the surface. And uh, here's a representation of uh, you know, our own solar system in this Goldilocks zone, or the habitable zone as it's known, uh, where Venus is towards the inner edge, towards the sun, just on the sort of hotter side. Venus has a runaway greenhouse effect, so it's hotter than it otherwise would be at that position. Mars is towards the outer edge. It's lost most of its atmosphere during its history, and so it's fairly cold and dry, although there's evidence that liquid water flows on the surface of Mars, even in the relatively recent past. There may have been life there at some point. There may still be potentially simple life uh, somewhere under the surface. Um, but there are many other systems now that we know of. When I was in elementary school, we didn't know of any, uh, any planets outside of the solar system. And now we know there are many. And from the statistics that we've done, we know, again, that about one in five of the stars, when you go out tonight, if it's clear, look up at the sky, um, you know, pick uh, 20 stars, and four of those, on average, will have an Earth-like planet in the habitable zone around them. Pretty amazing that, that um, we've been able to make those measurements. And you don't necessarily need to be in the habitable zone. There are icy moons of the gas giants in our own solar system that probably have liquid oceans beneath them. Maybe we'll be able to send spacecraft out there at some point and fly through these plumes that are gushing up from below the ice. And uh, sample those, look for biochemistry, see if there's signs that simple life evolved elsewhere other than the habitable zone, even in our own solar system. And that's not to mention the rest of the observable universe. So this is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. This is 11 days of exposure time with the Hubble Space Telescope. And this region of sky is the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length. It contains around 10,000 galaxies. And the star that you see, I'll see if I can highlight this star here near the center, is about 20,000 times too faint to be seen with your unaided eye, which is to say, you're looking at a grain of sand sized region of the sky that would appear completely blank if you were to look at it without a telescope. And the Hubble Space Telescope looked at it and it found 10,000 galaxies in this region. And this is not a special part of the sky. You look everywhere else across the sky and there are galaxies as far as the telescope can see. So there's probably something like a few hundred billion galaxies in the observable universe and a few hundred billion stars in each of those galaxies. And this really is quite profound that we're the only one of those places that we know where life has arisen. And so this question, you know, where is everybody, to paraphrase uh, Enrico Fermi's Fermi paradox, I don't really think it's a paradox, but it is a profound question, where, where is everybody? Um, we have to go out there and do some experiments, do some science, and actually look and see um, if we can see any evidence. Uh, I'm going to have difficulty reading this. I had in my um, presenter notes uh, here sort of a typed out version. I don't know how you're, maybe, maybe some of you are, uh, are better at reading cursive than I am. But um, uh, again, this is sort of a quote uh, along the same lines um, of those previous quotes that I showed. Undoubtedly, there are myriads of planets in the universe. The same formative principles must be operative. In the building up of the bodies, the inhabitants and their perceptions of the external world must be closely similar to ours. It's highly probable that many are as far or even more advanced than ourselves. Codes for communication and mutual understanding can be readily formulated on the basis of commonly perceived universal truths. And in this quote from, from Nikola Tesla, as you can see in the bottom in, in 1937, he says, by my inventions, well, okay, I mean, <laughs> good, good of you to take credit for this, um, it has become possible to transmit considerable amounts of energy at distances of thousands of light years, and if received, it can be easily detected in many ways. So Tesla was realizing in the 1930s that there was a possibility of going out and doing scientific experiments that we now call radio SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, or the search for techno signatures, in other words, um, signs that there may be technology beyond our Earth, experimentally. And so this is sort of laying the groundwork for the, the work that then uh, came along in, in 1960 with Frank Drake. Uh, Frank was a professor at UC Santa Cruz for a large fraction of his career. Um, lived locally down in Aptos, sadly passed away last year, but a real giant of the field, referred to as the father of, of SETI um, for the work that he did both experimentally and theoretically, including with the Tatel Telescope here at Green Bank. Shortly after it was constructed in the late 1950s, Frank did the first modern SETI experiment um, using an instrument that is uh, pretty, pretty basic by today's standards, plugged this into the back of the telescope, uh, and he had a single channel that he tuned through the radio dial, he looked at two stars and uh, looked at them for uh, over a period of, of several days for many hours. Didn't find anything for a while. And then actually he found a signal and he thought, well, that's interesting. Could it be this easy <laughs> if we found ET? 
And this was the, really the first example of uh, uh, what drives the search and our major challenge with the search, that we have technology here on Earth. It was probably a high altitude aircraft that was flying over that was picked up by, uh, by his instrument. He actually had to point another antenna out of the window and compare the signals that he was getting from the telescope and with this other antenna that he had pointed out of the control room there. And when he saw the signal in both of those antennas, he realized, okay, this must be something that, that's coming from nearby. This isn't coming from the sky because I'd only see it coming in through the telescope when the telescope is pointed at the star that I'm interested in. And so Frank had also cottoned onto something that we use today to reject this radio frequency interference, or RFI, to use the technical term, this interference that comes in from our own devices and, again, is the motivation for doing the search, but also the major challenge that we have to overcome. Frank was also a pioneer, as I mentioned, in the theory of SETI. Um, probably quite a lot of you have seen this equation, but I'm going to go through the terms in the Drake equation here. Uh, the number N on the left tells you how many communicating civilizations you should expect to find in our galaxy. Now, you can reformulate this and look at the universe, or you can reformulate it in various other ways and sort of define, well, what do I mean by communication? But let's just walk through the terms here. So the number of civilizations that we expect to find is this number R star, which is the rate of star formation in the galaxy, how many stars are formed per year, multiplied by a number F, P, the fraction of stars with planets, multiplied by a number N sub E, which is the number of Earth-like planets, these habitable zone uh, rocky planets you, you could consider uh, per, planet, per, per star that has planets, the fraction of those planets that develop life, the fraction of planets with life that develop intelligence, the fraction of planets with intelligence that develop the ability to communicate. And again, we can define communication however you want. I'm defining it as radio communication here, but and people have asked me, well, what, what about tachyons? And I say, well, if you can build a tachyon detector, I'll put it on the telescope, but I don't know how to do that. So let's talk about radio for now. And then let's talk about the lifetime of that civilization. I'm not necessarily talking about the civilization itself. I'm talking about the length of time that is releasing detectable signals into space, so radio waves in the case that we're talking about here. So this number might be around five, maybe around five stars per year formed in the galaxy, give or take, depends what kind of stars you're thinking about, but let's call it five for the sake of argument. And this was a number that Frank would have known when he formulated uh, this uh, formula at, at a meeting in Green Bank in the early 1960s, but he didn't know any of these other numbers. And again, you know, I mentioned when, even when I was a kid, we didn't know what fraction of stars had planets. But we now think it's probably close to one. It's something like 100% of stars have planets, and as I mentioned, one in five of them have an Earth-like planet. Let's call it a habitable zone planet or a small rocky planet where liquid water could exist on the surface. Again, we can debate whether that number should be bigger or smaller depending on whether you want to include the icy moons of gas giants and, and other places where life could arise. But we still have no idea what fraction of planets uh, give birth to life, uh, what fraction of planets with life develop intelligence, what fraction of planets with intelligence develop communication. We only have one example here. It's really hard to extrapolate from a sample of one. Here it seemed inevitable, right? Life, intelligence, communication, but it may not necessarily be the case elsewhere. And then the lifetime of that civilization, well, you know, think about sort of uh, existential threats to civilization, and maybe you're a little bit worried having seen ChatGPT that, uh, you know, the robots are coming and that they're going to wipe out life on Earth. Um, I mean, maybe even in that case, it's not bad news for SETI because we're still going to be able to detect the, the robots that are going out and, uh, you know, traveling across the galaxy. But it might be bad news for us, um, you know, as sort of squishy earthlings um, if, if this technology gets out of control. And so the interesting thing is, right, that you can actually measure, you know, if, if you're uh, an optimist and you say, well, okay, um, life is inevitable, intelligence is inevitable, communication is inevitable, you multiply these numbers together, and maybe it's a little contrived that I made them all multiply together to give one, but five times one times one fifth times one times one times one, n equals l. Okay, so if, you, if you're an optimist about the chances of intelligence and communication where the, the, the conditions are right to support it, then you're gonna think, well, if I measure n, if I go and look how many civilizations are out there, then I'm actually getting a handle on l, the lifetime of those civilizations. And I guess Frank was an optimist because this was his license plate uh, on his car with a UC Santa Cruz license plate holder. Um, so L is really, you know, if you're an optimist about the chances for life, it's governing how many uh, uh, communicating civilizations we should expect to see. And so uh, it's also been termed the archaeology of the future. You go out there, 
you, you either measure n directly or you put some limits on, on n, and you put some constraints on it, and then you find out how long a communicating civilization lasts for on average. If L is long, if L is you know, a billion years, then there should be a billion communicating civilizations in our galaxy if the assumptions about those, you know, the inevitability of life and intelligence are correct. If L is short, uh, you know, 100 years of radio communication, then maybe we don't have a good chance of finding them. But again, this is one of the motivations for why we have to go out and do this experiment. So I'm going to do something that you should probably never do in a public talk and attempt a live demo here. Um, you can't see it's plugged in on the, the podium here, but there's a little um, $30 radio dongle that you can buy on Amazon, and it comes with a little antenna. And I'm going to quit out of my talk, and I'm going to hope that this works. Uh, we'll be right back after a short break. I'm Terry Gross, and this is Fresh Air. Public radio. So um, they're taking a short break, so while they're doing that, I'm going to turn off the radio dial here. And this is a sound that you know, many of you are familiar with if uh, you, know, you have uh, an old analog radio while you tune through the radio dial. And on the dial here, I'm going to turn the volume down a little bit just so that you can hear me sort of talking over this. But we're tuned to 88.5, and I guess... Um, is 88.5 KQED down here as well? It certainly is in the East Bay where, where I live. So we're picking up the, the National Public Radio Station here at 88.5 megahertz. And what you're seeing here uh, across the graph at the top is a range of frequencies going from 87.4 megahertz up to 89. So again, think tuning through your radio dial. And then you see the signal that appears at this particular frequency. So that's the radio frequency. It's an FM radio station. And you can see this is the same signal that's scrolling down here off the bottom of the screen as you're seeing sort of instantaneously captured in time at the top. So you see, you know, again, I can just turn this up a little bit. Oh, I guess we've, we've, we've lost the sound here, which is fine. Um, so uh, you, you heard the sound coming through. Um, you see the frequency modulation here, right? These frequencies that are changing, that are encoding the audio signal there that's then being decoded by your radio on the other end. And so maybe you're thinking, okay, well, breakthrough, listen, they must be putting their headphones on, a la, you know, jo Jody Foster in contact and tuning through the radio dial and listening for weird things that are coming in from the telescope. That's not typically how we do it because we can represent the data uh, in, in this digital form here. And again, you know, just if, if you sort of take nothing else away from this slide, I'm going to show a few of these plots um, later on in the talk. Um, take uh, away the fact that we have a signal that's changing in intensity as a function of time and frequency. And so frequency on the horizontal axis here and then time is scrolling down. It's like water going over a waterfall, right? The water that's just gone over the top of the waterfall is at the top, and then there's water streaming off down the bottom here that represents how this signal appeared, you know, a few seconds ago. And so we call this a waterfall plot. Now, you can sort of freeze this in time, and it's still a waterfall plot. It's giving you the intensity of the signal as a function of frequency. You can represent this as an image, and essentially this is what our, our data processing pipeline does. It doesn't listen to audio signals. There's many other signals that get encoded uh, in radio, right? There's Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. All of our devices are you know, chatting to each other and to the radio towers. It's not necessarily uh, an FM radio signal that we're looking for, but it is some feature that obviously looks artificial, right? In this background of sort of blue noise here, that static hiss that you, you, you heard, you scan across here and you see there's something going on at 88.5 megahertz, and there's information encoded in that, right? There's, there's content, there's communication taking place. So that's sort of what I wanted to get across there right now. Let's see if I can uh, get back to my slides. Amazing, the live demo worked, right? So I had this back up just in case it didn't. Um, and so, you know, from this little radio dongle that you can get for $30, well, what could you do for $100 million? Well, it turns out um, quite a lot. And in 2015, uh, the Breakthrough Prize Foundation announced at the Royal Society in London the launch of a $100 million 10-year mission called Breakthrough Listen, uh, that would really revitalize the search. And part of that is buying better hardware than I have plugged into my laptop. Part of that is getting smart people to come work on the project. And part of it is getting access to telescopes that we can use um, that have you know, bigger antennas than, than the one I have here as well. Um, so uh, again, last minute, Andrew Simeon, my boss, um, uh, dropped me in it and said, OK, can you go on Fox Business News? I think he would have liked to have been here tonight. Uh, to talk to you all at the Silicon Valley Lecture Series. He was probably less keen to go on Fox Business News for whatever reason. Um, and so I was sent there to tell him I think the $100 million was sort of the thing that, that grabbed their attention. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the science and about how this really has sort of changed the field um, in, in the last few years. So we've got a bigger telescope. Um, 
Frank was using a telescope at the Green Bank Observatory, but we now have access to the Green Bank Telescope, a bigger telescope that's at that same site. It's 100 meters, so about 330 feet across the, this dish. It's the size of two football fields. Um, it's about 7,000 tons of moving parts. That's our chief engineer, Dave McMahon, for scale in the foreground. And you may be able to make out there's some people who have rappelled down on ropes from underneath the dish. They were painting the dish. Um, just before I took this photograph, uh, and I think it really kind of gives you a scale of the, the instrumentation that we're using, right? This is a bigger antenna than the one that I have here that I was just demonstrating with. So we have a lot of sensitivity, we have a lot of collecting area, and then we need a bigger computer, right? We don't just want to tune to that one little channel. You know, we, I, I was taking a couple of megahertz across the band there, so, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not sort of going to get too deep into sort of what I mean by these frequencies, right? But think of that little chunk of the band, you know, as, um, uh, you know, a few, uh, million hertz, and now we have billions of hertz. We have you know thousands of times more coverage across the spectrum, but with very fine resolution that enables us to look for um, very fine details in those water pour plots um, that are coming in from the instrument. We have a ton of storage, so it would fill up your laptop hard drive thousands of times, and we're writing uh, about 750 megabytes every second from each one of these computers and the 64 computers in this rack. So it's a much more powerful instrument than the little instrument that I have plugged in uh, to, to my telescope here. We've got a bunch of data in the archive and, and these are the data that we're analyzing that we're looking for the signals. I'm focusing on the radio search here and focusing on the Green Bank Telescope because as Andy says, this is my position as project scientist, but I can, particularly in the q and I can answer sort of questions about what we're doing elsewhere as well. Okay, so here's one of those computers, one of the 64 computers that we have there. And on the right, you see again, one of these waterfall plots. So the little region of the FM spectrum that you were seeing corresponding to KQED would fit inside one of these vertical stripes here in this image. So again, we've got much more coverage across uh, a range of frequencies tuning across the wide radio dial. And this is five minutes in time represented here again, going up and down this plot, so frequency horizontally and then uh, the, the time vertically and the, the intensity of the signal that's coming in. So we're looking for squiggles in this plot. And I think you can see some squiggles in here if you squint. So that's signal. Those are signals that we're picking up. So how do we know if they're from ET? Well, we're in the National Radio Quiet Zone, so this helps. This is a federally protected region around the Green Bank Observatory, so there's going to be fewer signals from uh, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and certainly things like FM radio stations, although that's sort of a different frequency to where we're typically operating. Um, but it's still not perfectly silent. It's not the radio silent zone, it's the radio sort of quieter zone, I guess. And there's still people who've ignored the signs to turn their cell phones off. Hopefully everybody's silenced their cell phones this evening, but you need to power them down when you're at Green Bank. There's still planes flying over. There's still, pe still people with garage door openers. Um, there's still actually people who have decided that they can't possibly live without Wi-Fi, and so they've set up Wi-Fi hotspots in their homes. Um, SpaceX has just launched a bunch of Starlink satellites. Uh, there's a, a funny story about a microwave oven in an observatory, not the Green Bank Observatory, that led to um, some sort of uh, uh, false positives, some, some things that they thought were, were interesting and later turned out to be some impatient person opening the door to check on their burrito. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's a lot of technology and all of this, again, is the, the sort of bugbear that plays into um, the, the, the challenge of, of uh, digging through uh, this haystack and here is an example of this haystack. One of my students, um, uh, Daniel Bautista, put together this plot that's showing now a range of frequencies way wider than the FM band. And this is over about 400 hours of observations of the Green Bank Telescope. And again, all you need to take out of this is these blue things are bad, right? There's Wi-Fi in there. There's um, satellite transmissions. We have to see through this, you know, nasty blue stuff, uh, the, these signals, to find this faint signal that might be coming from a distant star. So this is, again, another representation of the haystack, right? The, the U.S. has decided everybody gets a little chunk of frequency. You can't operate your Wi-Fi on, you know, 3.1 gigahertz. If you have Wi-Fi at home, you probably know it operates on 2.4 or 5 gigahertz, right? There's the, the two main bands that are used for Wi-Fi. And so your Wi-Fi signals are sort of buried somewhere in this plot. We can zoom in a little bit in here and see, um, you know, some of these reserve bands. There's a little chunk in the middle uh, around, I'm probably not going to be able to do this backwards here, sort of reading backwards. There's some radio astronomy bands. I think this one here, that's the 1400 megahertz band where Frank did his experiments. And now you can see all of these allocations that have been made, many of them since Frank did those experiments in the 1960s for different kinds of devices. So this really makes it challenging. We don't just have our own little bit that's reserved for radio astronomy. We have detectors that cover 
from the left side to the right side of the screen and they pick up a bunch of radio frequency interference. And it really is sort of like looking for a needle in a haystack. You've got to get very good at recognizing hay if you want to find the needle and not throw the needle out with the hay. So how do you do that? Well, I have a microphone on here. There's some directional microphones here that are good at picking up signals that are coming from a particular direction. And so we can use the Green Bank Telescope a bit like a directional microphone, and we can point it at a star that we're interested in, and then we can point it somewhere else, and then we point it back at the star, and point it somewhere else, and we can pair the signals, actually just like Frank did in the 1960s, that are coming when the telescope is pointed at the star, and that are coming when the telescope is pointed off that position. And if there's a signal that only appears when we're looking at the star in question, then maybe there's a chance that it's actually coming from that star rather than from somebody's Wi-Fi or from a satellite going overhead or this kind of thing. So here's a little animation. Hopefully you can see this. I don't know whether the, the lighting is uh, good enough here that you can make this out, but I, I'm going to go ahead and play this. And um, what you see uh, sort of in the middle here is uh, here's a star that we're looking at. So this is the star Vega in this case, pointed at the star, pointed away. And we're going to point back at the star. And then we're going to point somewhere else. And then we're going to scroll across to another part of the sky, and you'll see there's tons of satellites. This is the geosynchronous belt here. So this is where all your direct TV and those kind of satellites are. And here's the star that we're looking at. And you can see as the star moves across the sky, or as the Earth rotates and, and the star moves, that we're not going to land on the same satellite three times in a row. So this really is a good filter. Even if the satellites that are in, in geostationary orbit um, we're not going to hit those three times in a row. So it's a really good filter. We call this a spatial filter, basically looking at the position on the sky and trying to localize the signal in space. So that's great for getting rid of some of this interference. And so what we get out, again, is waterfall plots. So we get a waterfall plot for star A and one for B, back to A, one for another star C, one back to A again, and then one for a third comparison position D. And now I could set any one of you in this room the task of look for things that appear only when we're pointed at A. So you're looking for things that are just in the top row here. I've drawn some boxes around things that I think are signals, and I've injected a fake signal in here that is maybe what you might expect if you were looking for aliens, right? So the aliens appear just when you're pointed at star A. I don't think it would appear like a, a little image like this, you know, quite so neat in the plot. But if there is some signal that has some distinct characteristics that only appears when we're pointed at that star, that's very interesting. You'll see also, um, particularly in the right panel here, you've got a, a couple of red boxes that I've drawn around this signal, which again, if you're paying attention, you'll see are at 2,400 megahertz, 2.4 gigahertz, probably Wi-Fi or Bluetooth from somebody who didn't turn off their phone. Okay, so uh, there's another technique that we can use to filter out interfering signals. Many of you, I guess, if you've been coming to these astronomy lectures for a while, will be familiar with the concept of Doppler shift or, or redshift in the sense of astronomy, right? So things that are moving away get their light shifted towards the red end of the spectrum. Things that are moving towards us get their light shifted towards the blue end of the spectrum. And that's true of radio signals as well. If a radio signal is, is moving towards or away from us, then the frequency that's being emitted at is not going to be the same as the frequency that's being detected at. It works for sound as well. In this case of an ambulance coming directly towards you, good idea to get out of the way if it's really heading straight, straight towards you like this. But the sound will come because it's blue shifted, it will come in at a higher frequency, a higher pitch uh, in this case. Now, you know, hopefully you're not in the habit of standing in the path of ambulances, um, but you probably have seen them go past on the street, and you hear the you hear that change in pitch as they go past, because the relative velocity, the speed relative to you, is changing as the ambulance goes past. It's changing over time. The ambulance might be going at a constant speed, but its speed relative to you is changing, and you get that change in pitch. And so we're not talking about a Doppler shift in this case. We're talking about a Doppler drift, a change in frequency with time. And that's a good way of figuring out if I see a signal, if you know, I'm looking at KQED at 88.5, and suddenly it's at 88.6, and then 88.7, and oh, I mean, either something's gone very wrong with KQED's transmitter, or uh, it's not actually KQED. It's some transmitter that's in motion with respect to my receiver. And so um, this Doppler shift, there's a little page um, here uh, explaining this from a paper by one of our former students, Sophia Sheikh, um, with some art by, you'll see a lot of art by, by Danielle Fusilar. Um, she does a lot of great art for us, uh, and you'll find this in our press releases as well, um, showing these, 
planets spinning around, uh, orbiting stars, maybe with transmitters on them, and the motion of those planets relative to the telescopes on a rotating Earth, and as the Earth is rotating around the sun, are gonna introduce this Doppler drift, and so we can look for Doppler drifting signals that appear localized on the sky, and that gives us a really good way of throwing out a bunch of the junk that we're not interested in. Okay, so here now, again, are these waterfall plots, but now I've stacked them up, so uh, on the target at the top, they have funny names. This is from the TESS input catalog and the Hipparchos catalog, and they got some long phone number. So here's this star, the, the A star that we're looking at, some of the B star, A star, B, A, and B in this stack, and you see a signal. We found a signal, right? And it's a Doppler drifting signal. Oh, this is great, this is exciting. It's changing in frequency with time. Maybe we've found aliens. Well, it's there when we're pointed at the off target, right? So it's, it's there again when we point at the off target. It's there again when we point at, at the last off target. So this is not a good candidate for a signal from ET. It's there wherever, we, wherever the telescope is looking, even though it has that Doppler drift. So we need both of these um, to help us filter things. But here's a good one. So we're on the target. It's got a Doppler drift. And then this red line here isn't the signal. The red line's just to guide your eye and says, okay, well, this is where it would have been in the next plot, but it's, it's not there in the off target. And then here it is again in the on target. Well, that's exciting, and it has a consistent Doppler drift. Actually, it's deviating away a little bit, so maybe it's not accelerating uniformly. Maybe, you know, everything's in motion with respect to each other. Well, this is kind of cool. And then it's gone again when we point the telescope elsewhere, and then it's back. And then it's gone again. This is great. This is very exciting. And uh, Alain Levy, who was a high school teacher um, working with me uh, one summer, came and he said, I, I, I found a signal. This is great. This is very exciting. And I said, well, we kind of set you up on this because that's Voyager 1. Um, so this is, you know, it's extraterrestrial intelligence, but it's our own extraterrestrial intelligence. We built this thing and sent it into the outer solar system. So it was, you know, something like 14 billion uh, miles away at the time. But the nice thing is that we can observe it. I mean, we know where it is on the sky, so we did point at it, and then we pointed away, and we pointed back and away. But when we compare the signals and when we run them through our software, the software said there's something weird here. It's got a Doppler drift, and it's absent in, in the off observations. This is a good candidate SETI signal. And indeed, um, you know, here, here it is, the, the Voyager spacecraft. And you can actually go, um, you can, if you play around with Python programming at all, or, you know, you, you have, um, uh, students in school that, that have some Python skills, they can go and download our data and work through this in, in uh, their Python programming and actually find this signal using the same code that Alan did, which is pretty, pretty neat. So the transmitter on Voyager 1 is 20 watts. It's the same power as the light in your refrigerator. Um, and so how can we pick that up from, from 15 billion miles away? Well, we have a very big dish. We have the GreenMink telescope. And it also has an antenna on it. It's not 100 meters, but it's a 3.7 meter antenna that focuses those radio waves and beams them towards us to the extent that that 20 watt transmitter looks like a one megawatt transmitter when it's received at our telescope. It's beamed that energy into a, a, a tight beam that's pointed in our direction, and then we can pick it up with our big dish. And uh, the term that we use for this EIRP here, equivalent isotropic radiated power, is a little bit of a, a mouthful. But what that means is, well, if it was transmitting in all directions, then we'd have to have a big one megawatt transmitter. But we can get away with only having a 20 watt transmitter uh, to give us that equivalent power that's going out in all directions. And so um, this, again, is sort of what we use to measure how bright these transmitters appear when we're doing our experiments. So there's Voyager 1. Um, so uh, if you're familiar with, with uh, you know, log scales, then, then this will make sense to you. If not, don't worry. Fainter things are towards the left. Brighter things are towards the right. And I already said uh, a million or 10 to the 6 watts equivalent, right? It's 20 watt transmitter, but 10 to the 6 watts if it was broadcasting in all directions is Voyager 1. The whole solar power that's falling on the Earth is about 10 to the 17 watts. And so that's, uh, you know, um, uh, what's that? 100,000. Uh, uh, trillion watts, so did I get that right? 100,000 trillion watts falling on the Earth. And if you took all of that power and then broadcast that as radio waves, then that's where you would be. Uh, so again, you could imagine, well, let's focus that, you know, let's not use all of that power, let's focus it into a little narrow beam and send it out in one direction. Maybe we want to target somebody receiving on the other end, that'll take less power because we're concentrating this one signal. But it'll look like the equivalent if it was broadcasting in all directions would be this, this 10 to the 17 watt transmitter. 
The Arecibo telescope, sadly defunct uh, now, but it had a radar transmitter on it that used to be used for uh, imaging uh, of um, asteroids in the solar system, uh, for imaging the, the other terrestrial planets in the solar system. And again, you've got a big dish with a transmitter, but it looks like it's really bright, right? It looks like it's 10 trillion watts. It's not that bright. It's just focusing a lot of that energy in one direction. So it looks like, um, you know, in this case, that it is uh, 10 million times brighter than the, the Voyager 1 spacecraft. That's how, how intrinsically bright it would appear. And so, well, 10 million times brighter, right? We can see Voyager 1 in uh, the outer solar system. So, um, uh, well, then that means that we could see um, that the Arecibo telescope a thousand times further away, the inverse square law, if you remember that from school. So you could get distances of a thousand times uh, and you need something that is 10 million times as bright and then you could pick it up. And it turns out that's the distance basically that, that uh, if you move Voyager out to um, orbiting around a nearby star, um, you know, you do, again, do the back of the envelope math. Don't worry if I'm, I'm sort of, uh, you know, losing in the details here, but we can use the same telescope, the Green Bank telescope that we used to pick up Voyager 1 to pick up something that's as powerful as the Arecibo telescope around nearby stars. And so there's a, a potential here to do this experiment for real, right, to see if there's technology out there like the technology that we have here on Earth using only the technology that we have to receive those signals. So I have a couple of students who uh, looked at planets that were found by the TESS telescope, so this is the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, and these are hundreds to thousands of light years away, so you'd need more powerful transmitters on their end um, than we have currently on Earth. But if you put those transmitters at hundreds of thousands or thousands of light years away and then look for them with the GBT, so these are planets that were found in transit crossing their host stars, and uh, we know that the planets are there because we see these little dip in light as the planet passes between us and the star, and then we point the radio telescope at it to say, well, as they're going across their star, are they transmitting something in the opposite direction to somebody who might be looking at them and watching that transit? And so that's what these students went away and did. And then you can get some numbers on this plot, right? So I showed you that uh, line back here, right? There's uh, faint things to the left and bright things to the right, bright transmitters. And now we have another dimension on this plot. This is the busiest plot, I think, that I'm gonna show you here. So again, if, if you're a little lost, then um, just focus on faint things to the left, bright things to the right, and then common things up at the top and rare things down at the bottom. And you can see there's a bunch of points on here. So we've made real measurements, and this is the only thing that really that I'm trying to get across here, that we've made real measurements of, well, I mean, and these are not detections, right? They're just, they're measurements where we're putting some constraints on this. So if you look in the bottom right of this plot, we've said, well, there are not uh, even a few very bright things out there. We would have seen them. Even if they're rare, if they're very bright, we'd have detected them with the telescope. And then if you look up at the top left-hand corner, we say, well, there are not a lot of faint things. We've looked in a lot of places, including some nearby stars, and if, if there are common transmitters out there that are comparable, again, to the Arecibo telescopes, the things that are like our own technology, if there's more than one of those per 100 stars or so, we'd have seen it in the surveys that we did so far. We've looked at hundreds of stars for things that are as bright as the Arecibo transmitter. So not a lot of uh, 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 faint things and um, certainly not many bright things at, at all. There, there, there are stronger constraints on the bright things. But we really need to get down into the bottom left region of this plot here, right? We need to do more thorough surveys to say, well, maybe there's a handful, maybe one in a million stars has technologies like here on Earth. So we need to look at more targets. We need to look with more sensitivity. We need to fill in this plot. And, you know, the point really here is, again, the takeaway, you know, if you're, if you're baffled by the axes, there's a lot of unexplored space here, you know, and, and going off this plot as well that we have to try and fill in. So we've only looked at a small sample of the parameter space. Indeed, I have another student, um, Carmen Chosa, um, who's working with me, who's looking at whole galaxies. So this is now not nearby stars. She's looking at nearby galaxies where the transmitters have to be hugely powerful. And so she has some numbers down here where it's like, well, these are ridiculously powerful transmitters. They're very much towards the bright end of the spectrum. But there's billions of stars in these galaxies that you can see all at once with a telescope. And so we can put constraints on you know, even one in a billion transmitters that are extremely powerful that would be, you know, out of this, this far end of this plot. Hopefully that makes sense. I can come back and sort of go over this a little bit more if there's any questions. Jill Tarter at the SETI Institute said uh, it's kind of like we've sampled a glass of water out of the ocean and looked in that glass and said there's no fish in the glass. 
so there are no fish in the ocean. And again, we've got some, I, I played around with another AI um, generative tool here called Midjourney, and I asked it to imagine planets and space in a glass of water. The glass is on a beach by the ocean. This is what it came up with, and I think it's sort of a nice little metaphor for what we're doing here in terms of sampling this. And I'd also like to suggest, I love Jill's analogy that uh, you know we haven't looked very well if we're looking for fish in this glass, but if you put that glass under a microscope, it's teeming with life. There's a, a ton of life in the glass. You just need a different tool. You need a different technique um, to explore that. And so maybe we actually need different techniques. Maybe we're missing some of the signals. Maybe we're, uh, you know, I'm not saying it's, it's tachyons. Again, if you can build a tachyon detector, let me know. Um, but maybe there's signals in the data that aren't these Doppler drifting signals that are very simple and that, uh, you know, that don't look like that alien picture that I showed you before, right? They, they, don't, they might not be those narrow little lines. They might be other interesting features. Um, so again, we've we got a lot of work that's been driven by our interns. I mentioned Sophia Sheikh already. She was a summer intern with us in 2016, now a postdoctoral researcher at the SETI Institute. Shane Smith, summer intern in 2020. Uh, and they also were looking through the data like our uh, teacher Elan was, and they found a signal that was pretty interesting, and it looked like it was coming from Proxima Centauri, which is the nearest star system to Earth. And so, well, this is exciting again, you know, like, uh, like Frank, could it, could it be this easy? Can we find signals like this? And uh, this actually leaked to the press. It leaked to the Guardian, and then it ended up being picked up by the New York Times and by Scientific American. Was that a drop call from ET? Alien hunters discover mysterious signal from Proxima Centauri. Could this be the ET signal that we're looking for? Well, I haven't got the whole plot here, uh, but I've sort of given the game away as well. You see here on the right in this blog post by Sophia Sheikh, it's not aliens, but it is a huge leap forward because it really improved our ability to vet these signals. It was there in the on observations, it was gone in the off observations, but we had to do some more investigation and some more checks. And we came up with this, I'm not gonna go through this plot at all, but we have this flow chart where it's like, well, is the instrument working? Is the signal only in the on source? Is the Wi-Fi at that frequency? Is there a lot of RFI that we know? Is the drift consistent with our technology? Blah, blah, blah. You can work through this again. We can come back to this if folks are interested. But the main thing is science has to be repeatable, right? That you actually have to go and then look back and see is it still there? And if it is, you've got to call somebody else up at another telescope and say, hey, look at Proxima Centauri. Do you see anything? And indeed, when we went back, we didn't see anything, and we also found a lot of look-alike signals in the data, and so we found things that sort of mimicked this, this signal, BLC1, Breakthrough Lesson Candidate 1. We found other things like this in the data, and we realized it's sort of um, you know, just a pernicious thing that, that fell through these filters, right? The spatial filter and the Doppler filter are very good, but they're not perfect. There are things that fall through that still are gonna fool you every once in a while. I can come back again and sort of talk about vetting and how we do this and why we're not convinced that this is ET um, in, in the questions if folks are interested, but we're not convinced. Um, so, you know, well, again, what might we be missing, right? There's this great um, uh, cartoon from Tom Gould, the new, new scientist, about a professor making the horrifying discovery that messages sent across the universe by advanced alien civilizations and unknown solar systems have all been going into her junk mail. I know you've had the experience of finding important things in your junk mail, um, so maybe our filters are too strict and they're throwing some things out that we actually really are interested in. So um, when Breakthrough Listen was launched, uh, one of the things that we were charged with doing was bringing a Silicon Valley approach to the search for intelligent life. So how apt that here we are in Silicon Valley, bringing the Silicon Valley approach, where you can type ET into your search browser and you can get lots of uh, images of ET, including, I love the one down at the bottom right, it's uh, ET dressed up as Mr. T from the A-Team. Um, so, uh, you know, Google's got very good at training on images, at finding features in images and saying, I think this is what you're looking for. You asked for ET, here's a bunch of examples. Uh, and, um, you know, this is uh, an example of machine learning in action, right? The Silicon Valley approach using these AI tools to find stuff in data from the internet. And now there are these generative tools. I mentioned Midjourney, and you ask Midjourney to imagine ET, and it says, well, ET looks like a lizard, you know, with a hood and maybe rides a bike. You know, this has seen a lot of pictures of Steven Spielberg's ET as well. Uh, so, you know, there's also biases that are built into the algorithms. And I mean, it, it's very important also for things like, you know, a, a racial bias in bank loans and, and, and other things that, you know, people are going to start using these, these tools for machine learning. 
and it gets a lot of the biases that are sort of in the system baked into it. So th this algorithm thinks ET looks like ET from the movies. It's not going to imagine another ET um, that may be the ET that we're looking for. So be, be very careful, you know, with all of these tools, you know, with the, the chat GPT and the generative tools, they have all of our human sort of biases and, and um, sort of misconceptions baked into them. So it's not a perfect, um, you know, panacea to finding the thing that we're looking for, but it can be helpful. It can help us imagine, uh, you know, what, what these signals might look like. It can help us find the signals that are in this haystack of data. And so another student, Peter Ma, uh, used a machine learning tool called an autoencoder. And this, you know, initially I was scratching my head, like, you know, why, what is an autoencoder? And he explained it to me, well, okay, you take, imagine you draw the number four, and then you feed it through an encoder and it kind of boils this down into some latent space. It boils it down into sort of what are the essential characteristics of fourness in some way that make it different from three, at least in terms of how you write it on a page. And, and the machine figures out, okay, I think I've got a handle on what four is. And actually your brain does this as well, right? As a neural net, it can recognize that's a number four. I've got a signal coming in and need, you know, any other, I mean, I had a lot of training to recognize that's a number four, but. Uh, it's pretty clear to you immediately that's a four and, and not a nine, for example. And then the decoder takes this sort of boiled down, you know, again, the latent space, this idea, okay, I've got some representation of the number four, and it reconstructs it, and it says, okay, here's a number four that I reconstructed for you. And you say, well, so what? Like, I, I fed a four in, and you gave me a four out. Like, why, why do I care that you can reproduce fours? And the answer is that by kind of doing this feedback loop, basically by matching the output to the input, you can be... Uh, confident that what you boiled this thing down into, this representation of it that's in the middle, this compressed representation, actually really does represent the thing that you think it does. And that's how these generative tools, um, you know, like, like Midjourney work, where you say, imagine ET, it's got some sort of conception in, it, in its weird computer brain about what ET looks like, and that's stored in this sort of compressed form in the middle. And it's very, very powerful, because then you can associate that with other representations of different things and say these things are more similar, these things are more different, and you have way of comparing uh, things um, you know, by, by using these, these artificial intelligence algorithms. So Peter simulated some ET uh, examples, and if you've been paying attention, then you know that the example on the left is not ET, and the example on the right looks a little bit like it could be ET, or it's a signal that's there and gone and there and gone and there and gone, and it's drifting in time, even though it's in this noisy background, right? So we might have some Wi-Fi signal that the ET signal is sitting on top of. And Peter simulated a whole bunch of these, and he trained this autoencoder, like, like your brain can recognize the number four. The autoencoder said, I got really good at recognizing signals that you're not interested in and signals that you are interested in. And then he said, okay, now that you've learned that, go and look at all of the data from the telescope that doesn't just include the signals that I simulated, but includes you know, all of the signals that are present in the data. And it said, sure, go ahead and do that. And it spotted eight potential ET signals, eight technosignatures. Now again, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, like I'm not about to announce at the Silicon Valley lecture series that we found eight alien civilizations. Um, I'd love to break that news to you, but uh, you know, again, we don't think these are ET and we've gone through the vetting process and we have, um, you know, again, it has to be reproducible as the main thing. We've got to look back and find these signals again. Uh, and in fact, you know, in a comment to space.com, um, one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Steve Croft from the, the University of California at Berkeley, Project Scientist of Berkeley on the Green Bay Telescope. Oh, that's me. Um, he said, uh, so th these are pretty good, Peter. I mean, good job. The, the signals are present when we look at the star. They're absent when we look away, as opposed to local interference, which is generally always present. And they change in frequency over time that makes them appear to be far from the telescope rather than local interference. But I caution, in massive data sets with millions of signals, a single signal can have both of these characteristics just by chance. It's kind of like walking along a gravel path and you find that annoying stone that's stuck in the tread of your shoe, right? That stone that was just waiting for the tread to come along and bam, it fit. And now it's stuck there and you're trying to kind of, you know, wedge it out. But most of the stones didn't get stuck in your shoe, so it's still a really good filter, right? It found, uh, you know, that one sort of perfect match that, again, we don't think is ET, but it's certainly sort of interesting in the sense that it fits our filters, it fits our expectations of what an ET signal should look like. And so we have these powerful tools that we can run on the data um, that don't require as much human vetting as well, which is really important as the amount of data scales up and they can flag things that look interesting and bring them to our attention. So we have this sort of you know, search tool, the, the Silicon Valley approach, the search tool for ET, which is pretty cool. 
Um, I also mentioned to Peter, I said, this is great. You know, he did this, um, it spent a while working on this last year, and he had this paper that was in Nature Astronomy, and we had a press release, and it's all great. And I mentioned to him, you know, before uh, the, the holidays in December, I said, it'd be great if we could do reverse image search as well. Like, if we could say, okay, I'm not going to describe to ET, now I'm going to give you a picture of ET and say, find all the other things that look like this, right? So it's sort of a variation on, on what I just showed you in terms of kind of training it on the simulated signals and saying, find me things that look like the simulated EC signal. Now I'm saying, I've got some candidate. Find me all the other stuff in the data set that looks similar. Remember I said the BLC1 signal, the signal from Proxima Centauri, we ultimately uh, rejected in part because there were a ton of similar looking signals in the same data, um, a ton of sort of stones on the path that looked kind of, you know, just the right shape, if you like. And Peter went away over the holidays, and I wasn't really expecting him to do anything on, on this, but he kind of he got it in his head, oh, I, I can code this up. And so our first meeting in January, he built sort of reverse image search um, for, for our data. Super, super cool um, result. Here's another paper that's going to be coming out on that. Um, we, again, we have amazing students working with us. Um, and so, you know, these tools uh, combined with the imagination of these young people that are, are building this stuff, I think are really going to revolutionize the search. Um, here's what it outputs. So, you know, he fed in... This example on the top left, uh, the algorithm said, I found a really good match on the top right. And we said, well, that's, that's the same one that we input. And it said, yeah, I know. It's like, I, I found the best match. It's the same one that you gave me. OK, great. But I found a, a bunch of other ones as well. And, and it ranks them in how similar they, they appear. And it's doing a really good job of finding similar signals. And so we can use this again to understand the data, to understand the environment of this radio frequency interference, and hopefully to to build, um, you know, better steady search pipeline. Okay, so I'm going to um, wrap up in, in a minute or two, but I, I wanted to um, uh, just sort of uh, put this into context of the search for life more broadly, right? How can you find life? And again, thinking about the Drake equation, right? Um, you can look for simple life. You can look for, uh, you know, biology on Mars. There might have been biology on Mars in the past. You can go and scrape up uh, the dirt and, and give it a little sniff, or maybe you can, you know, send your, your helicopter around to kind of look for it. Um, you can get little sample tubes that you, you leave there, and then some rocket will come and uh, you know, bring them back to Earth, and we look at them in a the lab. You can build a big space telescope like JWST and send it out there to look at the atmospheres of extrasolar planets. And it's a very hard measurement to make. We're going to be able to do this for a handful of planets around nearby stars, but we might be able to tease out the presence of oxygen or water vapor or methane or ozone or other things in their atmospheres that might give us some signal that there's maybe life on these planets. So the top two here, you know, are kind of billion dollar games, right? NASA is investing a bunch of money in this. And then we've got the technosignature search, right? So by analogy with biosignatures, signs of biology, technosignatures, signs of technology, the SETI search that's down at the bottom here with the Green Bank Telescope. Now, you know, $100 million is a lot of money. We're grateful to the Breakthrough Prize Foundation for their investment. But you might think looking at this, well, you know, NASA surely is onto something here. NASA knows, they've looked at the Drake equation, right? There must be more biology than technology. You go through that equation, there's a certain fraction of stars of planets, certain fraction of those with life, certain fraction of those with intelligence, fractions, 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 multiply fractions together, you're gonna end up with some small number at the end, right? And there's a really nice paper, uh, and um, you know, I think there's some blog posts about this as well that you can go and find by our colleague Jason Wright at Penn State. Um, it's a little bit of a technical paper, but I think you know, having sort of sat through this talk, you'd understand some of this. And Jason says, look, there's a good case for technosignatures. They might be abundant, long-lived, highly detectable, and unambiguous. And the reason why Jason lays this out is, well, yeah, sure, some fraction of planets have life, but, uh, you know, and then some fraction of those planets with life have intelligence, and some fraction of those develop communication. But uh, if you looked in our own solar system, you'd find one planet with life, and you'd find several with technology. You'd find the rovers on Mars. You'd find the Voyager 1 in the outer solar system that's not even associated with a planet. You'd find probes uh, around Jupiter. You'd find, uh, you know, technology everywhere. And it's that you could find it with the technology that we have. You can point the Green Bank Telescope at Mars and see our Martian probes that are in orbit around the planet, right? This is uh, not sort of, you know, it's a needle in a haystack, but it's a pretty obvious needle. And so technology can spread. Um, particularly automated technology, and if they develop, you know, AI and uh, AI-powered spacecraft that don't need, you know, feeding and, and, and watering, basically, that could spread throughout the galaxy, then we might expect technology to be everywhere and life to be rare. So the technology might be abundant. It might be long-lived. Again, our 
maybe our machines will wipe us out, and I am a little scared sort of seeing some of these uh, you know, tools that are coming out. Uh, you know, hopefully it, it, it turns out for the best, but maybe biological life is actually a relatively short phase or biological intelligence compared to machine intelligence, which could last for potentially billions of years. So it might be long live. It might be highly detectable. You can only find uh, the, the uh, signs of biology with the James Webb Space Telescope and a handful of nearby planets, but the volumes that we can probe, as I showed you with my student Carmen, who's looking for signals that are traversed into galactic distances, are huge. You can look at billions of stars. And okay, you'd need a powerful transmitter, but maybe those transmitters are bright, and maybe uh, they're highly detectable. And they might be unambiguous as well. Some little uh, you know, spectral line in, in the atmosphere of a planet, oh, maybe it's oxygen, you know, maybe it's water vapor, well, is that, even if you're confident that you've detected it, uh, is that really un unambiguous evidence that there's life there on that planet? Well, I think there'll be a lot of argument about that, as there will be argument about uh, candidate techno signatures, but some of them have the potential to really be unambiguous, that you know, alien face that appears in the waterfall plot, the digits of pi in binary, um, you know, a signal that at pi times the hydrogen frequency. I mean, you can also read, you know, Carl Sagan and, and, and the, the, the sci-fi literature and figure out, well, you can imagine yourselves, what might they be doing? It might be really unambiguous. And so I think there's really a case that we should be investing more in the search for techno signatures. Uh, and, you know, it should be sort of on par there with the rest of astrobiology. And indeed, we're doing that. And I haven't had a chance to tell you about all the other telescopes that we're using, not just the Green Bank Telescope, uh, not just radio telescopes, but optical telescopes, including facilities up at Lick Observatory, like the Automated Planet Finder. And as uh, the astronomy community said in 2020, when they were sort of summarizing the state of the field, it's an exciting time in which to practice the astronomical craft as humanity edges ever closer to being able to answer the age-old question, remember at least 60 BC, are we alone? It's humbling and exciting to contemplate that the question of whether life exists elsewhere, it could be answered with the technology humanity now possesses. And another way of putting this, as Kokoni and Morrison did in 1959, is the probability of success is difficult to estimate. But if we don't look, the chance of success is zero. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for that exciting introduction to the search for life elsewhere. And I'm going to encourage people in the audience to line up at the microphone, which is right there in the middle of the room, if you have a question. And to take the questions and get the question period going, I want to introduce the dynamic astronomy instructor who's currently teaching at Foothill College, uh, Dr. Jeff Matthews. And he teaches courses uh, about all aspects of astronomy. He teaches labs and honors classes. If you're nearby, you should definitely check out the classes at Foothill College, not just in astronomy, but in so many other fields that are open to the community. But here then to cure Curate the questions is Dr. Jeff Matthews. So, thank you, Andy, and thank you, Steve, for coming out and, and speaking uh, with us this evening. And so, the the whole time watching your talk, I was thinking, this is. Uh, you know, providing the Cliff Notes version of the current course that I'm teaching, which I entirely structure around the Drake equation Drake. here. And, you know, and, and even my other class that I teach in spring quarter, where I'm just like, oh, the final two quarters, it's all this. Um, and so uh, I see that we are starting to get a line here of folks uh, for, for questions. And so please feel free to just uh, to queue up. And uh, we will go ahead and take the first question for Dr. Croft. Um, hi, Dr. Croft. Uh, I'm going to date myself a little bit here, but in the, in the 80s, in my first PC, um, there was a program you could download that would do uh, SETI analysis for you. Yeah. It would do it for, I don't know if it's still going on. Yeah, um, that, that was actually, it was a little later than that, if, if memory serves. It was late 90s that they, that they came up with a SETI at home uh, screensaver. Um, right. And that was actually based out of the Berkeley SETI Research Center, our, our group at Berkeley. Uh, and it ran for, um, you know, the best part of 20 years, crunched through a lot of data, and, um, it, you know, basically generated huge amounts of uh, um, sort of information to follow up. There's a lot of stuff that, that went into the database and essentially... Uh, 
know, the team that was working on that realized that they still had kind of a big haystack on their hands of signals that these volunteer PCs had kind of phoned in and they needed a new method to actually search through that. And so they're still exploring, again, sort of using some of these tools similar to what we've been using for Breakthrough Listen um, to look through the, the, those uh, databases of signals that came in through the volunteers and um, did my mic just die now? Um, and, and, and see if there's anything interesting in there. So they stopped the sort of volunteer computing part of this. Um, we've been thinking about sort of maybe um, there's ways in which we can kind of get the public more actively involved again um, you know, in the search. Part of the problem is that you know, now, as you saw with those big computers that I showed in the early slides, we really have so much data coming in that we have to build a supercomputer actually out at the telescope in order to crunch through the data. So that's sort of been the, one of the major reasons why we've moved on from the, the volunteer computing. But, but thank you for contributing to that. So actually, my question was a little different. So we've been broadcasting on Earth for, I don't know, 50 to 100 years, essentially. Um, when you were talking about it earlier, about the, I forget the name right, but Achibo, the, the, the uh, radar, uh, you Arecibo, know, yeah. Arecibo. Yeah. Um, if you were on a different planet somewhere out there and were listening to Earth, what would you have discovered? And I'm, I guess I'm putting the planet within the next 50 to 100 light years from here. Yeah, um, it's a good point. So, uh, you know, it depends on how big an antenna you have on your end. If you have sort of Earth-like technology on your end. Well, I'm asking what you would have discovered. So you got whatever you got yeah. sitting there 50 light years away. There'd be a good chance that we would not have discovered anything. Um, so, you know, again, this is sort of in the example where I showed, uh, you know, we'd have seen very bright things even if they were rare. We'd have seen very faint things if they were common, but if there were just a handful of faint things out there within that volume, um, you know, and or if they weren't deliberately targeting us, which is sort of the other example, right? If they have this telescope that they're pointing at you or an antenna, a broadcast antenna that they're pointing at you and they're like, we're gonna signal you and you're pointed in the right direction to pick that up, then it's relatively easy. But if they're just transmitting kind of willy-nilly and they're not transmitting um, a particularly bright signal, then there's a good chance that we would have missed them and that's why we need um, you know, more sensitive telescopes, we need um, bigger surveys of the sky, we need sort of better instruments. Um, and, and even that said, you know, I still think we're, we're in the running um, as I mentioned at the end, for the, the chances of making a detection with these instruments that people talk a lot about, like James Webb, you know, which again is not gonna find biosignatures unless they're very unambiguous and very common. Thank you. Yep, thanks. So we're here in Silicon Valley, and one of the famous things about Silicon Valley that people talk about is Moore's Law, mm -hmm. which basically, you know, is a measurement of the improvement of the silicon technology over yeah. time. And th that sort of concept, I think, applies in lots of different areas of technology. Yeah. You know, our, our battery technology, for example, is improving, and yeah. you can sort of project forward on that based on historical growth rates. So you mentioned from uh, uh, Mr. Drake's original work here uh, in the Bay Area with some, what you know, by modern standards, are pretty crude instruments, okay? And so my question is, what's the, uh, wh what's the equivalent of Moore's Law for our radio telescope sensitivity? How quickly is that improving? Because that seems to be, you know, sort of the missing piece of the yeah. equation to get the frequency down to where it's likely we're gonna be able to observe things. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the, there is a plot uh, that I don't have in my slide deck that sort of radio telescope collecting area is a function of time. And certainly, you know, the pictures that I showed you of the, the Tatel telescope from the 1960s and now the Green Bank telescope, the amount of collecting area has gone up and there is some sort of power law. It's not as, uh, you know, as, um, as rapid as Moore's law. Um, and there's also sort of better instrumentation, higher sensitivity instrumentation that we can put on the back of those telescopes that can ingest a wider range of frequencies at one time that can then be fed into the computers that are indeed driven by Moore's law itself in terms of the computing power uh, and um, you know, the storage, I guess, isn't Moore's law technically, but also is sort of following a similar um, exponential growth. And then again, you know, as I mentioned, the tools, the fact that really the, the tools are the incredibly powerful thing and, and that they can sort of run more efficiently like these machine learning algorithms um, that we have today. Uh, but one of the things that's happening with the telescope, sort of specifically to answer your question, is we're realizing that it's, it's pretty hard to build 
a bigger telescope, a bigger single dish telescope than the Green Bank Telescope. Um, we're probably not going to have a steerable telescope that's you know, 300 or 500 meters across. You can build big telescopes in, in, in bowls in mountains um, like they did with Arecibo and like they've done in China with the FAST telescope where you just, you don't point it very much, you just sort of sit it there in a natural depression in the ground. But an alternative approach is you build an array of telescopes and I think I maybe do have a picture of uh, an array in here. Uh, well, here's an array, but I think I, do I have the Allen telescope array? I forget whether I, I shoved it in here, I had some extra slides. But I mean, here, here's another example. This is actually an optical telescope um, where you have multiple uh, uh, telescopes that are working together um, to build up additional collecting area. And also in this case, again, this is optical. I should have a picture of the ATA in here somewhere. Um, but you can also do this for interference rejection because if you see the same signal coming in at multiple telescopes, um, you know, or in, in some cases if you don't see the same signal coming in by comparing those, then you can sort of throw out those local signals. And so this is really powerful. Um, we're doing this with the Meerkat telescope in South Africa and with a very large array in New Mexico, the one that Jody Foster um, uh, went to in contact with the headphones on. We have hardware that's shipping out there um, that's really going to take advantage of the fact that we can scale uh, the collecting area in terms of the number of the telescopes and do a better search that way rather than just building big dishes. So sorry, a bit, bit of a long-winded answer, but it, it's, it's all good. It's all moving forward. The technology is improving in all of those areas. Yeah, I was sort of curious if somebody had sort of projected forward quantitatively, you know, that if you, if you assume this parameter of the Drake equation has a certain value, mm -hmm. okay, and our technology is advancing at a certain rate. Yeah. When does that cross over so that, you know, there's a decent chance for, you know, of detecting something? Yeah, I, mean, I don't sort of have... Are talking 20 years or, or, or 2,000 it, years? It's a, it's, a, it's a really good question. I don't sort of have the, you know, off the top of my head answer to it. I mean, I think, again, sort of in a hand wavy kind of way, right, we have a better chance now than we had 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Um, but it would be an interesting thing to figure out, yeah, if their technology is growing at the same rate as ours, and if our technology grows, like when, when could we do that within this search volume that you mentioned, sort of the 100 light year kind of sphere or whatever, that would be a cool kind of back of the envelope thing to do. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Kraft. I'm, my name's Dan Lappin with Genesis Designs. And so I'd like to ask a big picture question in the nature of basic science of inquiry in signal and communication sciences. And so at uh, several of the recent astrobiology conferences at SICOM and uh, uh, Goldstein, uh, the reference to one of Avi Loeb's from Harvard's comments of we, we're looking for a rock we've never seen before. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious, you know, the kind of the difference between biology and, and physics and astrophysics and astrobiology, there's some kind of cultural senses of how we measure itself. So I'm curious as, as I, as I, I come from the biology perspectives, mm -hmm. you know, look at, you know, let's get a piece of technology like that. And in the, in the arc of history of the science of measurement, we've got different types of devices that we've used to point somewhere and get some measurement and compare it and things like that. And the, one of the dialogues that's happened in some of these astrobiology conferences is, okay, well, we have this principle of the origin of life, at least here on Earth, that's hypothesized, mm -hmm. that there's some primordial soup that progresses through gaseous stages, crystalline stages, into protocell stages, into something of a last universal common ancestor that becomes, through the tree of life, a mammal. Mm -hmm. And so the hypothesis is that as we stand here as humans, inside of us are clues to the origin of life. And so my question is then regarding our inquiry methodology and per se the nature of listening. So as we, as in, in your field, to what extent is the anatomy and physiology of the ear and the vestibular system used in our inquiry methodology where the structure of the internal vestibular system looks like the progression of primordial uh, states uh, to the protocell. And so as we're asking these complex questions, okay, we've got a, you know, a million, a billion planets, what do we do next? How much are, are your teams going to an inner space inquiry of, hmm, what should we do next? Looking at external data versus, okay, how can I use my system's biology versus just you know, central nervous system to inquire into the nature of the problems in front of us. Yeah, I think, you know, maybe if I can sort of paraphrase your, your question and let me know if I've got kind of the gist of this, but, mm -hmm. um, 
you know, we have inevitable biases as, as humans in terms of the way that we perceive the world and in terms of the way that we imagine, you know, this sort of other, uh, you know, intelligence to be that's on another planet. And maybe we're being a little too narrow-minded by extrapolating from what we do as to figure out sort of what they might be doing and what kind of um, you know techniques we might use to find them. Am I, I, I grasping that? Yeah, if we're going, if we're, there's this great mystery out there. We don't quite know what we're asking for right. or what we're looking for. How many different ways can we inquire? Right. And are we using prefrontal cortex, brainstem, central nervous system versus systems of biology, the deeper structure of intelligence, not the so, genome, to yeah. inquire? Like, huh? What should we do next? So I, I think sort of you know what. What, I, what I'm doing, and you know, there are certainly other people out there who are taking sort of a variety of approaches, but we're using um, you know, the tools that we have at our disposal to sense kind of across the electromagnetic spectrum and to look for anomalies that are consistent with um, you know, our ideas of what technology might be out there. Now, I'm willing to admit that might be some subset of all possible signals, of all possible communication methodologies, but it's a good place to start. It's a good place to look um, you know, to, to go out there if, if you're doing an experiment to keep an open, uh, you know, to keep all of your senses open, um, you know, in the same way as um, you could imagine, you know, you're looking for snow leopards in the Himalayas, well, um, you know, just sticking your head out of the tent in the morning and figuring out, oh, no snow leopards and then zipping it back up again is not as thorough as doing an aerial survey with drones, looking for signs of scratch marks on trees, looking during the daytime and the nighttime, looking for signs of scat on the ground, you know, trying to get yourself into the head of what they might be doing, which still might not be sufficient because maybe they're doing something completely different that you haven't imagined, but it's a good place to start. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for your talk. It was wonderful. Um, we can only, you, you stated that if we were looking here from somewhere else, we wouldn't probably be able to see ourselves from a reasonably short relative distance. Does that mean that we're going to have to look for things that are higher on the Kardashev scale to actually be able to see something? Yeah, I think, you know, um, again, to get back to, and I am going to pull this plot up again just because, um, you know, I, I sort of, it's a complicated plot, but I think it's it's sort of a good, um, a good example. This one here on the right. So, um, you know, the things that are higher on the Kardashev scale, in other words, sort of technologies that are way beyond what we have here on Earth, harnessing of energies that are greater than, you know, all of the energy that's falling from the sun on the Earth, you know, almost up uh, towards the scale where you're uh, harnessing the entire energy from your star that might be required to make transmitters, certainly transmitters that are broadcasting in all directions as opposed to these very directional ones up here. You know, these are sort of very... Uh, um, uh, uh, you know, very large extrapolations from what we have here on Earth, but we're able to put our strongest constraints on those things. We're able to say, you know, there's not a whole bunch of very powerful technologies, certainly, again, with asterisk, asterisk, you know, that are transmitting in the radio, you know, at the frequencies that we're looking at, at the time that we happen to be looking. There's a bunch of caveats in here. Um, but we can constrain that much more strongly than we can constrain the presence of Earth-like technologies where, again, we've only really been able to do that for sort of a handful of nearby systems. But we keep getting better. We get better technologies. You know, as, as I said in the answers to the earlier question, sort of bigger telescopes. Um, you know, we've got to start somewhere. And I think, you know, we've, we've made a good start. We're doing better than we were a few years back. Um, you know, even a plot like this, um, you know, most of the points on this plot were, were not there, um, you know, 10 years ago before Breakthrough Listen started. So the fact that we're going out and we're just sort of you know, putting a, a, a stake in the ground, I think, is is really good good progress. So we're really we're building tools right now to yep. essentially what's happening. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. Let's just take the last two. Okay. All right. Two more questions. Hi there. Hi. Um, my knowledge of science is low. Technology, even astronomy, even lower. So my questions are going to be easy. Um, when calling a planet capable of sustaining life, which is a very common phrase, how come nobody is qualifying that statement by saying human life? Um, well, I mean, <laughs> again, I, so that, I guess to get back to the Drake equation, um, you know, I was, uh, as I went through that, um, where is it? Uh, I guess maybe I went past it. 
Um, oh, here we go. Yeah, so, you know, I, I, I said at the time that I introduced this, right, that we, we could be sort of pretty open-minded about this, and I'm prepared to say, um, you know, maybe there's life as we don't know it. Maybe there's life, I mean, you know, uh, you, you can talk to Professor Fracknoy about how some of his science fiction, uh, you know, imaginings and, and other um, things in the science fiction literature about life that might exist, you know, between the stars or even in the stars themselves, right? We could uh, extrapolate this, um, you know, in an equation like this and conclude maybe there's more life out there than, than we imagine um, by sort of constraining things to this simple biology, as you say, on the surface of an Earth-like planet. So I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely prepared to, you know, be um, less stringent in, in terms of the definition of some of these numbers in this equation. And so that leads to my second question, which is that, is SETI only interested in a science-based um, exploration um, or indication of ETs, or can they examine and research the interactions that humans have claimed to have? And is anybody in SETI interested in doing that? Because um, science is great, but there's way more than science that can be well, I mean, I think, give information. Um, so, you know, as I said sort of at the beginning of the talk, there are certainly, um, you know, a lot of claims um, that are out there that have been made by people with sort of varying levels of, um, of believability and evidence of, um, you know, a range of uh, sort of mysterious phenomena, let's say. Um, and I, I think, you know, as a scientist, I think it's important that we apply the scientific method, which is that, you know, we observe and report and, um, you know, that we look for uh, reproducibility. Um, you know, there are important sort of tenets of science that, um, uh, you know, that, that are used to sort of vet claims. And there are people, um, you know, indeed, there are groups that are out there. Um, somebody mentioned, you know, Professor Avi Loeb that are looking into um, the, the unexplained aerial phenomena, or UFOs, as they used to be called. Um, you know, there are a range of people uh, out there who are, um, you know, investigating, um, you know, other, other claims um, that, that people have made in regards to, you know, alien contact and, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, for me, um, I, I think, uh, you know, again, we, we have to have some way of vetting these claims, right? We have to, um, you know, be able to use the scientific method to um, determine, you know, if you, if you come in, uh, and tell me, you know, a UFO just landed, um, uh, you know, on, on the campus outside here. Well, I'm going to go out and take a look, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to take your word for it necessarily. So we, we need some way of sort of, uh, of vetting. And I think um, that we're trying to apply, again, the, those sort of well-tested methods. And um, probably sort of somebody got it on their cell phone, <laughs> if that happened. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there's but, probably, you know, all the information we need is right here. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Okay, and last question, thanks. Hi. Um, so, at our current level of um, like radio wave production, um, about how far could we be detected with similar technology? Um, yeah. So, sort of in the, I think the most optimistic scenario in this question has come up in various forms um, so far. But if you had our most powerful transmitter, um, take the Arecibo radio telescope, and you pointed at something similar to the Arecibo radio telescope on the other end, so they know, you know. They happen to be lined up. They know where they're transmitting. We know where we're looking. Um, the answer is sort of thousands of light years, basically, um, you know, across a significant fraction of the distance across our galaxy in that most optimistic scenario. And then again, you know, everything else is, well, you know, with a less powerful transmitter uh, than, uh, you know, a, a smaller volume, basically. But that, that's sort of where we're at. So um, the Arecibo, or however you say it, um, that was like sending out a signal, right? It, it was, uh, and it like was actually used, again, you know, Frank Drake comes up, up a lot. It was used by Frank to send a message called the Arecibo message um, that he beamed out, uh, you know, in the 1970s using this radar that was designed mostly for, uh, again, sort of mapping the planets in our own solar system using radar, looking for hazardous asteroids and this kind of thing. Um, but, yeah, it has been used um, uh, just once, to my knowledge, I think, to, to transmit other people, I mean, of course, we're transmitting all the time. We're transmitting, um, you know, uh, KQED radio. We're transmitting. Yeah. Um, that, that's what I meant. Yeah. Like, just the things that we are doing basically yeah. unintentionally. Yeah, so those, um, we, we wouldn't be able to detect those with our current technology, but it's not a big extrapolation. Um, the next sort of generation or two of radio telescopes that we build here on Earth will be able to detect that so-called leakage radiation, the unintentional transmissions from a handful of nearby systems. Well, seems I'm out of time, so. Thank you.
Let's thank Dr. Croft again. And give yourselves a hand for being our pioneering audience. Thank you for coming out. And we'll see you at a future Silicon Valley Astronomy Lecture.